World War II was a dumpster fire and relatively speaking, it was over pretty quickly. The Cold War, on the other hand, was a slower burn, kept alive by various Western Bloc and Eastern Bloc powers, not just the United States and USSR. The Cold War is largely defined as a 45-year period of geopolitical tension strung tightly by the fear of nuclear holocaust. But this doesn't mean blood wasn't spilt. In fact, tens of millions of people lost their lives during the Cold War, often to weapons supplied by foreign powers during what many consider to have been proxy wars. While it's likely that some Cold War era proxy wars are familiar to you, many seem to go under the radar. In this video, we're going to discuss three of such wars. After ending Belgian colonial rule in 1960, the newly formed Republic of the Congo was ill-prepared for independence. As such, it fell back into chaos, most notably after black soldiers mutinied against their white officers in garrisons at Thiesville and Leopoldville, leading to a domino effect throughout the rest of the state. With whites fleeing into neighboring nations, Belgian paratroopers started descending on the Congo without the government's permission, and this led to violent altercations. With the state falling deeper into disarray, the government crumbled. Notably, the province of Katanga and the southern part of the region of Kasai declared themselves independent from the Republic of Congo, much to the chagrin of Congolese Prime Minister Patrice Lumumba. At this point, the United Nations stepped in, but they did not, as Prime Minister Lubumba had hoped, do anything about the rogue states of Katanga and South Kasai. Desperate, he went to the Americans for help. They sent him home empty-handed. The Soviets, however, were more than happy to answer Lumumba's call, sending in some 1,000 military advisors and consequentially creating disunity within the Congo's government. Now, the pre-existing fear that the Republic of Congo would turn communist was becoming a little too real for the Americans. Just as it was for Joseph Desire Mobutu, who in command of the Republic's army and with help from the CIA, ejected the Soviets and set up an entirely new government. Unfortunately for Lumumba, this turn of events resulted in his torture and subsequent execution. Lumumba's supporters, however, followed the man even in death forming a rival government to Mobutu's called the Free Republic of the Congo, which, despite enjoying Soviet support, was defeated by Mobutu in January 1962. With help from UN forces in the Congo, Mobutu put an end to the seceded states of Katanga and South Kasai soon after. In June 1964, after all this political upheaval, the Republic of Congo underwent a major constitutional transformation, becoming the Democratic Republic of the Congo. But many, namely the Lumumbists, weren't all that into it, and the two major violent revolts which ensued became known as the Quilu and Simba rebellions. At this point, the UN was already withdrawing from the Congo, so their forces weren't at full strength. This gave the rebels the breathing space they needed to establish the so-called People's Republic of the Congo, a one-party socialist state backed by the Soviet Union, China and Cuba. In Operation Dragon Rouge, however, 12 American C-130s and 320 Belgian paratroopers intervened, putting a swift end to a rebel hostage operation in Stanleyville and weakening the rebellion for its subsequent defeat at the hands of Mobutu. With the People's Republic of the Congo in tatters and with support from the United States, Mobutu finally seized lasting control in November 1965. This conflict came to be known as the Congo Crisis, during which as many as 100,000 people from all sides lost their lives. In the mid-1900s, holding the Yemeni throne was easier said than done. To ensure that the throne would go to his son upon his death, King Ahmed bin Yakya fought for it with tooth and nail. In 1955, for example, his palace was surrounded by 600 soldiers led by one Colonel Ahmed Talia, who tried to force him to abdicate. 
Binyakya, the sneaky devil, pretended to go along with it for some time. In secret, however, he was buying off Talaya's soldiers one at a time. When just 40 soldiers remained, Binyakya charged out of the palace with a scimitar and a literal devil's mask, cutting two of Talia's men down before whipping out an SMG and leading his own men to victory. Thanks to his cunning and bravery, Binyakya held the throne until his son Muhammad al-Baldir succeeded him in 1962. Al-Baldir, however, would be Yemen's last king. Soon after he was crowned, Al-Baldir made the mistake of appointing Abdullah Salal, a Nasserist, as commander of his palace guard. A Nasserist being an Arab nationalist whose ideology is based on the ideology of Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser. In September, Salal rallied the Yemen army and advanced on Al-Baldir's palace, shelling until Al-Baldir ran out the back door and went into hiding. After telling the world that Al-Baldir was dead, Salal declared that Yemen was now a republic. But this was just the start of the drama, as many remained loyal to the throne and some were even willing to die for it. Fearing a Nasserist spread, Jordan and Saudi Arabia fell in with the royalists, while Egypt, under President Nasser, supported the newly formed Yemen Arab Republic. But it wouldn't be Cold War without the Soviet Union, of course, which also assisted the Republicans, providing them warplanes and tanks, for starters. As stated by Soviet politician Nikita Khrushchev, any act of aggression against Yemen will be considered an act of aggression against the Soviet Union. This may come as a surprise, but by December 1962, the United States and the United Nations joined the Soviet Union in recognizing the Yemen Arab Republic. The British, however, invested as they were in their Aden colony in South Arabia, feared an Egyptian invasion and thus aligned themselves with the royalists. Under this covert arrangement, they committed British military planes to royalist resupply operations, as well as British advisors to royalist leadership, not to mention the 400 million they spent on air defense programs in Saudi Arabia. Between 1962 and 1967, several diplomatic solutions between both sides and their respective allies ended in failure, and the war was costing Egypt as much as a million dollars a day. Despite multiple large offensives by both the Royalists and the Republicans, the war came to a stalemate in 1965. It was around this time that Nasser admitted it was simply costing Egypt too much. Of the 70,000 Egyptian troops he had deployed in Yemen, Nasser recalled 30,000. Britain, on the other hand, completely abandoned its Arden colony in 1965 and with it, the Royalists. Feeling the heat of Egypt's simultaneous war with Israel, Nasser recalled a further 15,000 troops in August 1967, after which he signed a treaty with Saudi Arabia, essentially putting an end to both nations' involvement in the North Yemen civil war. Salal wasn't too impressed with Nasser, but the backstabbing Republicans' time was coming to an end. By 1967, Salal's popularity was at an all-time low, and in November, a Republican force stormed the presidential palace in Sana'a and forcibly removed him from power. But Salah's downfall wasn't the end for the royalists, who surrounded the city and started shooting their way out of the palace. Without Saudi Arabian supplies, however, and with Soviet and Yemenite pilots ripping them to pieces from the cockpit of Russian MIG-17 fighters, the royalists suffered a tactical defeat and essentially lost the war. The killing blow came when Saudi Arabia recognized the Yemen Arab Republic in 1970. To put the civil war into perspective, it cost between 100,000 and 200,000 lives, and Egyptian historians often refer to it as Egypt's version of Vietnam, with Egypt, of course, playing the role of America. In what we consider a classic move by the British Empire, the Brits just went ahead and kept the East African state of Eritrea after they defeated the Italians there in World War II. After the war, when the Eritreans were calling for independence, the British pulled another classic move and basically ignored them. That is until the United Nations stepped in. With help from the UN, Eritrea became a constituent state under the Federation of Ethiopia and Eritrea in 1952. Though over the next decade, the Eritreans grew tired of this arrangement and fought for their independence yet again, only for Ethiopia to annex Eritrea in 1962. This set in motion a Cold War era conflict that would rage for almost 30 years, the Eritrean War of Independence. Spearheading its push for freedom was the Eritrean Liberation Front, 
which for all its enthusiasm was unfortunately built on a poor foundation. Fighting within the ELF led to its fragmentation and in turn, creation of the Marxist-Leninist Eritrean People's Liberation Front or EPLF, not to mention the 3,000 who lost their lives when these two organizations went head to head. What brought them together again was remembering they had a common enemy in the Ethiopian government which had problems of its own. In 1974, the Provisional Military Government of Socialist Ethiopia, or simply the DERG, overthrew the Ethiopian government and established a Marxist-Leninist state that they were simply unable to sustain on their own. As such, they opened their doors to the Soviet Union. Conversely, the United States became Eritrea's main squeeze, despite the fact that the EPLEF was a Marxist-Leninist organization. By 1977, the EPLF, still friendly enough with the ELF, were spearheading Eritrea's independence movement, having seized all but three of Eritrea's cities and towns. By taking advantage of the concurrent Somali offensive on Ethiopia, the freedom fighters were primed to achieve their goal. Their strategy, however, was thwarted by the Soviet Union, Yemen and Cuba, who provided the Ethiopians with the weapons and manpower, including as many as 18,000 Cubans, to stave off the Somalis. Armed to the teeth, the Ethiopians drove the Eritreans back and almost completely shattered them in the siege of Barentu and the Battle of Masasawa. But the Eritrean freedom fighters were not wholly undone. They continued to harry the Ethiopians guerrilla style until the 1988 Battle of Afabet, where they turned the tides of the war by forcing the Ethiopian army to flee the Afabet and its surrounds. Soon after, the Soviets withdrew their support, putting Ethiopia on its back foot and allowing the Eritreans to reclaim their war-torn nation. Over the next five years, the United States helped Ethiopia and Eritrea negotiate peace, under which Eritrea finally gained its hard-earned independence. To put it in perspective, as many as 160,000 Eritrean soldiers and 40,000 civilians perished in the war, as opposed to as many as 1 million Ethiopians, according to an American case study. But what do you think? Were you aware of any of these three conflicts before now? And more importantly, would you like us to make another video about the lesser known proxy wars of the Cold Era? Please share your thoughts in the comment section below. And just before you run off guys, make sure to check out some of the links in the description below, including our all new history channel called The Braved, where we go through history to find all the badasses of history and to tell their story. It's a real high quality channel, so I suggest you guys check it out. And if you want to join our behind the scenes Discord server and get access to a couple of exclusive videos, do consider donating to the Patreon. And if you just want to join our wider community, check us out on our front Discord, our front Facebook and front Instagram where you'll get access to exclusive content you won't find on this channel. Anyways guys, as always, thank you so much for watching and I hope you learned something new.